And a really warm welcome here to Birkhead Free Church. Um, my name's Peter, if we've not met, I'm the minister here. Welcome online as well, if you're watching along from home. Uh, welcome to our all-age service. You might wonder what's going on here. Well, uh, all will be revealed uh, as we go on. So no Sunday school today, we're all ages in together and um, we'll be exploring one of the parables of Jesus from Luke's gospel together. Um, just a couple of things to mention. Uh, as always, hopefully you have an order of service from Donald on the door that will guide you through our time together. Um, just a reminder that we're back here tonight at 6 p.m. Um, for our Hogmanay service. That's a Burkhead tradition. We have a service uh, on Hogmanay, and uh, well, it happens to be a Sunday this year, so that's convenient. So that's, uh, that's our Hogmanay service and our 6 p.m. usual evening service uh, rolled into one. So come and join us for that if you can uh, this evening. Uh, don't forget as well, as we head into the new year, uh, we will soon be at the 17th of January. What's the significance of that, I hear you say? Well, of course, it is the start of our Hope Explored course uh, we'll be meeting um, here in the church building for that. So now's a great time to um, be thinking, who could you invite? If you have friends or family who maybe wouldn't normally be in church, maybe they came along to a carol service or something like that over Christmas. Um, now's the time maybe to follow up and say, hey, would you like to come back? Um, I'll come with you. Let's go together um, to Hope Explored. And there's details on the back of your sheet about that for how to sign up as well um, and so on. Uh, well, in just a minute, we're going to um, open in uh, song uh, with uh, the words of this great Welsh revival hymn, uh, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer. It's a, it's a hymn that, that asks that God would uh, save us, lead us, and guide us. Will he do that? Well, the words of our call to worship from Psalm 103 answer with a resounding yes. The psalmist says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That will be the theme of our service, as you'll see. For now, though, if you're able, let's stand as we sing together.
and we're going to pray together. Our God, uh, our Father invites us, his children, to speak to him, and uh, Mike's going to lead us in our prayers. So thank you, Mike. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we contemplate the end of the year, we cannot help but to look back and think of what we should have done better. Failing you, Lord, our neighbours and our loved ones. We also reflect on the battles we face every day with the enemy, not just in the world around us, but that which is within ourselves. Where we wage constant war every day trying to think and do what is right. We acknowledge that often we turn away from the fight we choose and we choose the easy road and we let friends down. We let brothers and sisters down and most of all, we let you down. We remind ourselves that we are commanded to live apart from the world, shine like a lamp and testify our Christian discipleship through the good that we do. Father, it feels that we fail so terribly, but sometimes it feels like we are on our own, fighting a losing battle against a strong enemy. Sometimes fear takes us and we turn away from our foe and we turn away from the Holy Spirit who discerns in our behalf. Then our sword feels blunt and we feel drawn to do the things we know are wrong and we feel powerless to prevent it. We remember that some of us have lost dearly loved friends and relatives and we still hear the echoes of their voices in our heads, where we, where we relive joyful memories and the feelings of closeness, love, and careless laughter, full of happiness. But in our hearts, we know they are gone, and consigned to yesterday, they return to dust, and Father, we feel lost. Oh, what a dark world we live in. But you have spoken to us. Your words are there for all to read. As the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And we remember that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Father, we bring our sins to you, and we acknowledge our state and repent of our sins, and we ask for your forgiveness. In you, Lord, we have faith. And now as we look forward to next year, we look up and we keep our gaze fixed on you, regardless of the troubles which are part and parcel of our existence. And in fact, we realize that we are lucky because we have you. We know as Christians we are broken in flesh, but complete in spirit. And all around us we see those who have a God-shaped hole sitting in the middle of their souls. We cannot even begin to contemplate our existence without you. We realize that although we are small, we are strong when we put our faith in you. We realize that the battles we are fighting are already won. We are well equipped with the armor of God and the belt of truth is firmly buckled and the shield of faith is mounted securely on our arm. The sword, the sword stays sharp as long as we listen to the Holy Spirit inside us. Father, we rejoice. Your truth is perfect and your righteousness is flawless. We see you at work in our lives and our church and we know we are impatient, but we see your work all around us. We see our beloved brothers and sisters all around us. I see my beloved brothers and sisters all around me. So Father, as we contemplate this year, we put our failings behind us, for there is no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus, because Christ Jesus is the law of the Spirit, which has set us free from the law of sin and death. Through you we have justification, not condemnation. We pray that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we hold up our heads and look to, to our priorities as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We promise to support each other. We promise to love and care for each other. 
We know our beloved departed brothers and sisters are with you and in perfect peace. Help us to stand firm in your sight. Bless our work here in Burghead, especially with the development of our Christian mission here in Murray. Bless the Hope Explored course and bring seekers to our door. Bless and support, to all, all, bless and support us all as we navigate the course of our lives. And particularly bless and care for those working in Ukraine in support of the people over there. Help us keep our eyes fixed firmly in your direction. Help us to ensure that everything we do in your name is done with faith and love. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give us what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Amen. Mike, thank you for leading us. Now, you thought you were coming to the church today, but really you've come to a dinner party. Work with me here. And in a minute, we're going to read from Luke's gospel the story of a dinner party. So we'll read it from Luke in a minute, but first of all, here it is in a more visual form. Simon. Okay, here it's not in a more visual form. We've been having trouble with that over the last 24 hours. It's the story of Jesus invited to the house of an unlikely man. The man's name is Simon. Uh, well, let me ask you, boys, did anyone know, particularly those who've been to Elgin and seen the video already, <laughs> what sort of a man is Simon? What is he? Oh, five hands, that's good. Um, <laughs> Go on the camera. He's rich. Well, he might have been rich. We're not really sure. Probably he was, but what was he, Alex? A Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. Now, what's a Pharisee? A bad guy. Well, we need a bit more nuance than that, Jamie. What does he feel? What's a Pharisee? Well, he didn't like Jesus very much. We're going to see that. Yeah. What is he, Jamie? He's a teacher of the law. He would know the Bible really well. So you might think he really would like Jesus, wouldn't you? But he didn't. Anything else about the Pharisee, Ruth? He's He's a religious authority, put it that way. But into his house came a woman who was very, very different to him. And he looked down on the woman. So in a minute, we'll read it from Luke's gospel. But before we do that, we are going to sing again. Because in the story, we we see that Jesus is full of grace and compassion for those who know that they're sinners and know that they need him. So here's some words from the book of Psalms, Psalm 36. I love these words. Give thanks to God. Why? For good is he, for mercy hath he ever. If you're able, let's stand as we sing.
today's reading is from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. It's found on page uh, 1036 of the Pew Bibles. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them clean with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him for 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. He then turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put your oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, that her great love shown has shown, but whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Douglas, thank you. Uh, if you have that open, keep it open. We're coming back to it. Just before we do, um, here's another psalm that speaks about the goodness and grace of Jesus in bringing us forgiveness. Words from Psalm 32. These are also some of my favorite words. I seem to say that about every psalm. <laughs> How blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sin. Richard's going to come and lead us. Let's stand, shall we, as we sing together. Well, please have a seat. If you've closed Luke's Gospel, now's a good time to open it, although there are one or two things on the screen to help you as well. Over the next couple of weeks, and by the way, this includes tonight's Hogmanay service, we have a short series called Are You Ready? Are you ready for a new year? I suppose 
New Year is often a time when we, we think about ourselves, we reassess our lives and our priorities. Are we heading in the right direction? And we're going to ask those questions with the help of Jesus and some of his parables. We are staying in Luke's gospel. If you remember, in the lead up to Christmas, that's where we were. We heard the accounts of the census and the journey to Bethlehem and the shepherds and the angels and the baby in the manger. But now we're in chapter 7, and the baby has become a man, and he is saying and teaching and doing things which are shaking up the world. Let's dive in. Have a look at verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. That's the setup here. So Jesus goes to dinner with a religious man. Now, um, the scholars among you will know this. This is not quite authentic. They would have reclined at the table, which means they would have lain down with their feet away from the table. Always good to keep your feet away from the table. Um, actually, that'll become important in a minute. But this is, this is the best I could do. So work with me. So Jesus goes to the house of a religious man, which is actually surprising for two reasons. First of all, just a couple of chapters ago, Jesus was eating in the home of a notorious tax collector called Levi, and now he's in the home of a very well-to-do upright Pharisee called Simon. So it's a broad company that Jesus keeps. It's also surprising, of course, because Jesus was in conflict with these religious people. But here's a Pharisee who's invited him to dinner. So maybe, maybe he's an open-minded Pharisee. <laughs> well, we'll see in a moment. So, a dinner party, which we have here, and you'll see that from your service sheet, or if you like, from the table here, there are four questions we are going to ask about this story today. We're going to ask, what's the story? We're going to ask, who is Jesus? We're going to ask, who are we? And then eventually, how should we respond? So here's number one. What's the story? Well, I think this is quite a well-known story to most of us. Into the minute, middle of this very nice dinner party bursts a notorious local woman. She is a sinner, and everyone seems to know it. Now, if I can speak to the adults for a moment, we, we don't get given the details, but given the language here, many people speculate that she was, shall we say, a woman of ill repute accustomed to nighttime working. Whether or not that's true, in she bursts and she makes quite a scene. Do you remember? Look at verse 37. She came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She stood behind him, remember his feet away from the table, stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Quite a scene she causes. But Simon, the Pharisee, whose house this is, and who knows this woman, he is not impressed at all. And he says to himself, remember, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. And in response to that thought, Jesus tells this very short but very punchy parable. It is a story with a clear message. Let's read it. Verse 41, two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One of them owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, and so on. So Jesus is telling Simon something very profound about this woman. 
Actually, Jesus is telling Simon something pretty profound about himself as well, but we'll get to all of that in a minute. The first question to ask is not just what's the story, but who is Jesus? It's a rhetorical question, Alex, don't worry. Who is Jesus? Now, as far as Simon is concerned, he's sitting here thinking, well, Jesus is someone to be curious about. Simon's invited him to dinner, after all. And I wonder if that's you. Uh, Maybe you're here today, you're watching online, you feel kind of curious about Jesus. Well, that's not a bad place to begin. So long as you know that, that Jesus is someone who is much more than just someone to be idly curious about. If that's you, maybe 2024, maybe the year to come will be the year when you take seriously the need to know more about Jesus. And maybe our Hope Explored course is the place to do that. But the truth is, Simon is not just curious about Jesus. To be honest, he's suspicious of Jesus. I wonder if you noticed Simon's language throughout the story. He hasn't really invited Jesus to genuinely get to know him. He'd much rather test him out or even catch him out. So if you have a Bible open, just look at verse 39. He says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him. And the implication, of course, is that he doesn't think he's a prophet, and therefore he doesn't know who's touching him. And then in verse 40, when when Jesus announces that he's going to tell a parable, Simon, the the NIV is quite polite in the way it translates it. It says, tell me, teacher. More literally, it's just, speak on. Speak on. You know, which is sort of a, a grudging agreement to hear the parable. It's not exactly an enthusiastic invitation, is it, to Jesus to teach. He doesn't really want to hear the parable, truth be told. But then when he does hear the parable and Simon is forced to give the obvious answer that the person with the greater love would be the person with the greater debt forgiven, the best that Simon can manage to do is to sound like a surly teenager forced to agree with his parents. Now, I'm sure none of you were ever that sort of a surly teenager. The best he can manage is, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And then, of course, later on, we find out that Simon hasn't given Jesus the customary greetings. No kiss, no oil, no water to wash his feet. These were normal things to do, but he didn't bother. So as far as Simon is concerned, Jesus is actually a bit of a threat to him. See, Simon, the Pharisee, as we learned in our answers, he likes to think of himself as being the religious authority in these parts. But of course, if Jesus is a prophet, and more than that, if Jesus is God's son, well, well, then Simon has been replaced as the religious authority in these parts. If that's true of Jesus, well, then Simon will have to bow to him and listen to him and follow him. It'll mean change in Simon's life. And and I guess Simon doesn't really like that idea. And the truth is, we can be like that too, can't we? Again, maybe you're new in church, you're just looking into these things, you're, you're kind of interested, curious in Jesus, but you know that becoming a Christian, that following Jesus would mean real change in your life. It would mean a new Lord, a new boss, which of course means that you would not be the boss of your own life anymore, and frankly, that sounds a bit inconvenient. But if that's you, and we all understand that instinct, if that's you, will you see here that in this story, Simon is clearly presented as a fool. He is the foolish one who misses out. Wonderful truth is right here in front of Jesus. In front of Simon, Jesus is in his own house at his own dinner table. If only he would open his eyes, but he won't. So that's who Simon thinks Jesus is, but who is Jesus really? Well, the first thing we see here is that Jesus is wonderfully kind. 
He comes to the house. He didn't have to accept the invitation, did he? But he comes to the house of this, frankly, hostile Pharisee. Jesus offers grace to all. I reckon he's also an amazing storyteller. This is a really good story, isn't it? It's so short, and yet in just a few words, words, he hits the nail right on the head. He sees the woman as she really is. He gets to the heart of things with Simon in just a few verses. Jesus knows people. He sees right through them. He sees us exactly as we are. He sees Simon as he is. You remember verse 44, he said, he turned to the, to, to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? But of course, Simon's problem is he doesn't see her at all. Not really. But Jesus sees right to her heart. He also sees Simon's heart. Speaking of which, do you remember verse 39? When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him, and so on. Did you notice, Simon doesn't even speak these words aloud. This is just what he is thinking, and yet Jesus hears him. So in one way, Simon's right. Jesus is not just a prophet. The truth is, he's much more than that. All of which is capped off by the time we get to verse 48, when Jesus says to her, your sins are forgiven. At which point the guests start to say, who is this? <laughs> who does he think he is? Who is this who forgives sins? Now, the reason they're so upset is because they know the answer to that question. This is the religious crowd, after all. Who can forgive sins? But God alone. So in claiming to forgive sins, what is Jesus claiming? He's claiming to be God. Sorry, that was not rhetorical, that one. It's very confusing, isn't it, when people do that? He's claiming to be God. Who is Jesus? He's Emmanuel. God with us. He's the loving Savior who, who offers grace and forgiveness to all, even this hostile Pharisee. So, what's the story? Who is Jesus? But of course, the next question is, who are we? That was rhetorical. Keep your hand there. <laughs> well, to answer that question, just look one more time very carefully at the parable Jesus tells. This is verse 41, okay? Listen carefully. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which will love him more? Now, of course, it's not rocket science, is it? The two people in the parable represent these two people at the dinner party. Simon, he was over there, wasn't he? Simon, who thinks he's good, and the woman who knows that she's a sinner. But here's the truth. The parable showed us that both of them have a debt they cannot repay. Both Simon and the woman are sinners. They have both done things that are wrong, both broken God's law, they both owe a debt they cannot repay, and both deserve God's judgment. But here's the wonderful thing. The parable shows us Jesus is willing to offer grace and forgiveness to both. The tragedy is, Simon thinks it's the woman and not him who's a sinner. So he's unwilling to recognize his need for Jesus. In all of this, just remember, Jesus is not saying that sin doesn't matter. He's not trying to downplay this woman's sin. Is she a greater sinner than Simon? The answer is yes. In the story, 500 denarii or 50. There is a difference, and yet the fact remains that both are sinners, and both need God's grace. And the point of the story, of course, is that if that's true for Simon and true for the woman, it's true for you, and it's true for me. 
God doesn't gloss over our sins. In fact, when it comes to the woman, the whole point of the story is that this lavish, extravagant display of love actually reflects the severity of her sin. She loves much because she has been forgiven much. All of which brings us to that lavish display the woman brings, which is our fourth point today. How should we respond? So let's read one final time, again, from verse 37. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And then, by contrast, go down to verse 44. Little number 44. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet her feet with my, my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head. She poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Now, at this point, you see, there is a wrong conclusion we could draw. We could get something wrong here. Is the woman saved because she does nice things for Jesus, and so he rewards her by saying, well, because you've done these good things for me, we'll bring you some forgiveness? Is that it? No, not at all. If you think that, you didn't read carefully enough. Verse 47 says, as her great love has shown. So the love she has for Jesus shows the fact that she has already been forgiven by him. And if you still don't believe me, then there's verse 50. It is your faith that has saved you, not your actions. Now look, I know for many here, most, maybe all of us here, this has been our experience as well, hasn't it? We have come to see that, that we are sinners in need of God's grace. We have placed our faith and trust in Jesus. And if that's you, and I know it is many, if not all of us here, I think the message of this passage for us is to look at this woman as an example of the kind of response that we too ought to be making to Jesus. I reckon we see two things in her. First of all, we see a public display of devotion. She does create quite a scene, doesn't she? Maybe you've been throwing dinner parties over Christmas or New Year. I bet this has not happened at any of them. And because of the way houses were in those days, it, it would have been a bit more normal to come in and out to a dinner party like this. It's quite a public scene, in other words. And in she comes, and there's tears on the feet, and her hair untied to wipe them away, and, which, by the way, would have been very unusual. Jewish women would have kept their hair um, tied up, especially in public. She does all of this in front of all of these people, and she is unembarrassed to show public love and devotion for Jesus. So the quest for us is, are we the same? Or do we think of our faith as something, well, quite private that we hide away or we keep for a Sunday, or, but not for public consumption. We don't talk about it at dinner parties, for example, you know, religion and politics. We don't touch, don't touch these subjects. Our culture has fed us this lie that, that faith is something private to be kept to ourselves. Nonsense. This woman has a public love and devotion for Jesus. She is unashamed to be known as belonging to him. She's unashamed to show her love for him and in public. But it's also, next, it's a humble, uh, sorry, a wholehearted display of humble 
service. That's quite a difficult one to say. Now, if you notice, she pours the perfume on his feet. It would have been more normal, as Jesus says, to put oil on the head. But I think she, she sort of thinks, oh, I'm, not, I'm not worthy to do that. No, the feet will do. And you probably know that looking after feet was the job of, of lowly servants. That's how she sees herself. She's a lowly, humble servant. Happy just to serve Jesus. To do whatever she can for him. And so the question for us is, well, is that us? Are we like that? We are saved by Jesus in part in order to serve him. Are we willing in our lives, in our families, in church life? Are we willing to get stuck in, to get our hands dirty, to serve Jesus in those tasks which may seem very lowly? The perfume, of course, is also costly. Costs her to do this. So the question for us is, well, are we willing to give of our resources, of ourselves, for the cause of Jesus? To serve Jesus in a way that really costs us out of our great love for him because we, need, we too know that our debt of sin has been forgiven. Is that us? So, we heard the story, and here are our questions. Who is Jesus? Well, just as we learned at Christmas time, he is Emmanuel. He is God come among us, which means he can teach with amazing clarity, he can forgive with absolute authority, and that is such good news for sinners like us because. Who are we? Well, we are sinners with a debt we cannot possibly repay. Heading only to God's judgment unless Jesus intervenes. But here's the wonderful news. Jesus has come to intervene, to pay the debt that we could not, to offer grace and forgiveness to all. And so finally, how should we respond well, we cannot earn our salvation any more than Simon or the woman could. But like that woman, we've got to come to Jesus throwing ourselves on his mercy. Publicly as well, Christian faith is not something private. It is public devotion. And of course, if our trust in Jesus is real, it will show itself in acts of public, costly love and devotion and service to him, the one who came to seek and save lost people like us. At this point, I was going to show you a video uh, to advertise our Hope Explored course. I don't think that's going to work. So I'll just say again, if any of these things are new to you, maybe you're like Simon and curious about Jesus, or you have friends who are, now is the time to make the most of this course. It runs from the 17th of January uh, we'll be looking at Luke's gospel, actually, at some of these um, incidents and episodes in Jesus' life. The thing I love about these courses is it gets people, newcomers, seekers, if you like, to actually open the Bible and look at the life and teachings and the death and resurrection of Jesus for themselves. So let me commend that to you. And just now, before we sing, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. For Jesus. Thank you that as Luke's gospel tells us time and again, he came to seek and to save the lost. Father, please forgive us if we have been like Simon, content to hold Jesus at arm's length, suspicious of him, sitting in judgment on him perhaps, Lord, help us instead to be like this woman. Help us to see the debt we owe that we could not repay. But Lord, help us to come to love and appreciate, to understand that Jesus himself has come to pay. Help us to respond in love and costly service. And we pray in his name. Amen.
Well, folks, here's a great song to end with. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain. Um, if you're able, let's stand, shall we, as we... Please do sit.